Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert. Today we're in Palo Alto, California, and my guest is Linda Tannenbaum, President, CEO of Open Medicine Foundation. And I want to say that Linda is by now an old friend of mine and one of the most dynamic and energetic people in the field of research, raising money, sponsoring research, and to some extent, organizing research. Linda, Thank lovely so to much. see you and welcome to the broadcast. So nice to see you again. Um, Thank you. Tell me about Open Medicine Foundation as though I knew nothing. Oh, <laughs> that's a big one. Well, our mission really is to facilitate collaborative research so we could find some answers to chronic diseases, especially in number one, MECFS. And then we really want to bring researchers together to really talk about this openly, share results, to move this as fast as possible, and really break the mold and the model of the way that they're doing research now. And then we want to teach doctors and, and tell them what we've learned uh, along the way, because so many doctors don't know anything about this. So we're really looking for a diagnostic, a treatment, a cure, a prevention, and to teach doctors along the way to be able to be aware of what this disease is, to be able to diagnose it and at least treat patients, their symptoms that are the worst, their symptoms right now, uh, while we're looking for a cure. And we really want to make people more aware of, of what this disease is and make the public aware of what this disease now, is. Now, you hold two meetings a year, or you've held two so far uh, each year, one at Harvard and one at, uh, out here in Palo Alto, is that correct? Well, this is our third year uh, in Palo Alto at Stanford University, and we had our first one at uh, the Harvard Collaboration was this uh, past June. And this yes. is to get researchers to talk to researchers, doctors to inform doctors, and is there a third purpose? Well, really, it's to have this open collaboration so people can share results. And we're not looking at uh, published results. Uh, we're looking at research that they're currently doing so they can talk, have an open roundtable, and talk it through, and really share ideas, and bring scientists and clinicians and together. The annual to talk about Palo Alto uh, mm -hmm. meeting that consists of three days of heavy science plus a public day for patients, advocates, etc. That, that's the structure? Yes, exactly. And we have over 50 scientists that come to that one. And, um, and the community day, we have usually about 300 or so people that come, and we live stream it and FaceTime live it. So we really want to let the public know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And letting the public know is an important part of your work? It sure is. It sure is. The public needs to know this to really be able to know that really a lot of research is happening and they need to have hope that there's a lot of researchers that are working on this now. Fundraising is essential. How difficult is it? Very difficult. <laughs> fundraising is everything because without funding we don't have any of this research going on. So fundraising has been really our, our number one and number two focus uh, to raise large, large funding so that we can really fund um, uh, the three collaborative research what centers is that we have now. What is in the millions? Well, I, uh, we have a goal for next year, and our goal is to raise $20 million in 2020, because 20 million people are suffering worldwide. So really, there probably won't be enough that we're going to raise. We want to raise a lot of money to be able to fund the research and move it as fast as possible to get How some How do you treatments. decide on research projects? Now, if you go to the government for research funding, there's an elaborate back and forth, and it's like a term paper. It's being marked and remarked, sure. and it takes a long time. And probably the result is not what everybody had in mind. <laughs> uh, how do you do it? Well, we have a scientific advisory board. So we have a scientific advisory board. We have two Nobel laureates on the scientific advisory board. We have 17 brilliant researchers that are part of this, and they help decide where to guide the research, where the research should be done, so that we have a big strategy plan, so that we can find a diagnostic, understand the molecular basis of MECFS, find treatments. And we have a scientific advisory board director, Dr. Ron Davis, and he leads the scientific advisory board, and we work together. What does your own background contribute? You were a scientist. 
Well, in my previous career, <laughs> I had a clinical medical laboratory. So I was familiar with all the laboratory tests, the laboratory equipment, all about patients. We had patient care and, and uh, we serviced the nursing home community uh, for, for over 30 years. And you were a biologist. So I'm a microbiologist, yes. So, so my background a, is in science. A, you know what they're talking about. I know what they're talking Which about, yes. helps a lot. <laughs> it uh, does. I have a lot to learn, but at least I know some of the lingo. Mm -hmm. Do you feel we're winning? You're winning? Did I feel there's progress. I feel there's real progress. And from where I sit, I want it now. We want to cure now. We want to treatment now. Diagnostic now. We don't have it now. Um, but we're moving towards that. So are we winning? It's a, it's a tough question. Uh, but we're moving, we're moving forward. What and do I do feel we are. Of the research that you're privy to, which is a lot of research, what do you feel is the most helpful, the most hopeful? What is the way you are expecting the most return? That's a difficult question because there's, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of research out there that's happening now that's not yet validated in in hundreds and thousands of patients yet so um, I, I, I can't say what is I, 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 I don't have an answer to that because there's things being worked on on the molecular basis there's things being worked on on the diagnostic and now we're looking to do some treatment trials and, and pilots this year so and next year so I, um, I I don't have an answer to that it's 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 more um, hopeful that all these things are going to happen at you once. You just said hopeful. One of the ways you you preach hope, you sign your letters yes. with hope for all. Yes. Uh, nobody else I know signs letters with <laughs> hope for all. I have a rather pedestrian cheers, um, which may mean that. Um, what is your message of hope? I really want the patience and people that care for patients to really know that there's hope out there and to hold on to it because we've had more research happening the next the last two or three years than ever before and there are hundreds of researchers now aware of this and wanting to do research for this um, and to really hold on because there are answers that are going to happen and I, I want people to know that and just to hold on to the hope. And your public outreach is to comfort patients or to assist them in finding treatment, doctors, diagnosis. What is the purpose of the public outreach? Well, with, with we really want to give them the tools to be able to go to their own doctor. Um, we are not referring. We don't have a referral basis for doctors, but we want them to have some tools to bring to them to be able to educate their own doctors. We want to be able to educate more specialists and bring more specialists so that uh, patients have more doctors to go to because the patients have nowhere to go to. So we want to try to have an outreach to train a lot more physicians to be able to see patients and be aware of this. And how do you go about the fundraising? Well, we try to communicate everything that we're doing. We try to be open with everything that we're doing. We hope to get publications out there of some of the research that's happening so that other people find out what we're doing. And, um, and then we, we approach people who are affected with this illness and sit down and talk to them and see if they can help fund this and see who they know and see who they might be able to refer to us. And then we go broader. We're looking for celebrity awareness. We're looking for the public help. We're looking for uh, people who just want to be able to help people, philanthropists. Um, so we have a lot of different outreach in a lot of different areas, and we're just looking for um, a, a large funding of people who want to help people. Would I be right to assume that the big foundations have been slow in coming forward in this area? Yes, correct. Uh, we, we don't have any funding from any large foundations at this point right now. Do you, do you know why that is? They, they have in the past played an important role. In, fund in, in, in fundraising for diseases? For diseases, yes. Um, I, I think um, this, this illness is just not aware, people are not aware of this illness yet. And we, we have to do a big push for this awareness uh, campaign. And we need an awareness campaign. ME-CFS is not a household word. Um, we, we sit with doctors, they don't even know what this is. So until it is, I don't think a big foundation will kick in yet until we can really uh, get, it, get the name out there. What is the genesis of the title Open Medicine Foundation? 
Well, we're open. We want, we want to, I really want to make sure that uh, whatever we do is open to other researchers for the purpose of fast forwarding and fast speeding up research. And, um, but this, uh, the name Open Medicine Foundation uh, came from my roots with um, uh, the Open Medicine Institute originally in 2012 and as deciding that we were going to have Open Medicine Foundation to really bring people together purposely to openly share ideas. So we kept open and we wanted to make sure that everybody knows that we want to share results and we're not holding on to it. We're in this really just for a cure and a treatment and diagnostic. For people in the field, what can they do? Advocacy, people, individuals who have sick relations or no sick friends, what can they do? Is it tell other people? Is it tell their doctors? Is it send a check? What can they do? I think you just name them all, <laughs> which is really what we need them to do, is really tell, it, tell other people, is really bring information to their doctors. And then if they can, do outreaches to, to others to try to help us fund this. We have a lot of money that comes in through social media and people sending out through Facebook and fundraisers that people just ask their friends for $5, $10. And that adds up when you do that all over the world. It really takes the whole world to fund this type of research. Mm -hmm. And how big is the foundation? How many of the employees? What is the, what is the structure of it? Well, Without counting, we're having an activity Saturday evening locally here, and we have 35 people coming that are part of our OMF team. But they're really all over the world. We have over 170 volunteers all over the world, and um, and we we each work in our individual areas. Uh, and uh, I have a, a core of people who are um, working with us on a daily basis. Um, they work uh, about 20 hours a day or so. They work very hard. Um, uh, but then we have all of these other people who do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We have consultants. We have uh, community ambassadors. We have staff. We have um, social media people. We have people who are are helping us do our fundraising and. And so it's a whole team uh, of people. It's kind of endless numbers at this point. Which countries do you feel outside of the United States are ahead both in research and in awareness? I don't think there's the countries are ahead, but there's other countries in Norway and Sweden and the UK and Australia that are doing significant research. Um, we collaborate with a lot of them and we, we, um, we, we all talk to each other of what research is going on. Um, there's not a lot of research happening in a lot of countries at this point, um, but, but those are the few that I know of. I understand the European Union itself puts no money into research. Uh, people have been writing to me, asking me to support a petition they have, mm -hmm. trying to get the European Union. Now, some individual countries, of course, right? But the the, the As union, the union. Uh, itself has no budget for this, which is really quite extraordinary, as it's generally quite good about that kind right. of thing. Again, it just takes awareness. They have to understand this disease at its core. They really have to see some patients, right? Those people who have seen patients know it's a horrible disease. It's truly terrible. It's, the, ter the, the, it's terrible. The, the terrible conditions that the patients bring to their families because yeah. it's 24 hours a day in some instances, not all, and that's very debilitating for a family. It sure is. It we brings hear. it down. Um, uh, we have uh, my photographers and myself, my wife is taking these pictures today. Um, we've been in some really desperate homes where simply the effort has been too great, where the caregiver can't cope yeah. from unwashed dishes to just just not being able to get the housework done and the job and the care. I know. No, it's, it's a horrible disease and truly it's everywhere in the world. You know, I travel to certain places and talk to uh, patients and visit some patients in their homes, and, and it is everywhere. Uh, and it's, um, there's so many adolescents that are home that can't go to school. Uh, there's so many people who have no, are, aren't able to go out of the house and, or work or, and have their lives, and, and it, it's just a, it's a, it's a real horrible debilitating disease. So we, we have to do something. Well, Linda, you're doing it, and you're Thank you. noble. Thank you so I'm much. So thank you, thank you so you. much for it's these wonderful interviews. Thank you.